When I first came to this village about 10 years ago, I knew nothing about it. And I happened to be just passing this cottage when a polite man came to the door and he asked me if I would like to come in and see the museum. He was very surprised that I had never heard of the Reverend Henry Duncan of Ruthwell, who started the very first savings bank in the world. Good morning. Ah, hello, how did you do? I was expecting to see Mr. Reed. Uh, Mr. Reed left here. Uh, he's away to Canada. He emigrated. Ah. He and his wife. Seemed to me an old man. He wasn't very young, but he was brave. Ah, yes. <laughs> so you're the curator? I look after the place now. Have you found it an interesting job? Oh, I like being here. Yes, very much. Thank you. The man himself is, um, the more you get to know about him, the more you want to know. He came here as a 25-year-old a in 1799, and he was full of ideas how to help people. Not so much on the religious side, maybe, but to help their lives, to help them in their poverty and how to cope with it. Was that what made him think of banking, then, as a way of overcoming the poverty? Well, he had trained as a banker when he was a young man. He'd gone for two years to Liverpool, and uh, his family wanted him to be a banker. There wasn't much left for a big family here. But he didn't like it, and the bankers in Liverpool said he would never make a success. So he went back to university and studied for the ministry. And this was his first charge in Russell. Henry Duncan was 26 when he came to the parish in 1799. It was from the Earl of Mansfield, a big landowner who lived in this castle, he had got the living. Duncan had grown up a son of the manse in a village southwest of Dumfries and wanted the quiet life. Duncan saw that even with those low wages, the village supported two alehouses. And he reckoned if they could do that, then there was a wee bit spare cash. And it was just being squandered. He thought if he could provide the means of safekeeping of that money, and an idea that they hadn't thought of, of interest being earned on the money, then the people might actually be able to keep something for their old age. And he got the idea, idea over to them, and it worked. Duncan collected the money once a week in this room and then took it to the uh, linen company bank in Dumfries and they gave him 5%, which is jolly good. It couldn't have been easy for the new minister to win even small sums from hard-working country folk earning 10 shillings a week. But many a mickle makes a muckle, especially when you get interest and home savings took off. Today, Ruthwell Kirk is the oldest building in the south of Scotland in regular use as a parish church. Its walls are mostly pre-Reformation. What gives it renown is a tall sculptured cross of early Christian times, unique in Scotland. This road leads through what used to be the glebe of Henry Duncan's manse. He worked this bit of land and made a curling pond near the house where he played the roaring game. But somewhere here, he did something much more important, and the present minister told me about it, Robert Nicholl. I think this bit of the glebe is the bit that interests me most, yes. because it was here that this famous, one of the finest two monuments in Europe, was put up. Tell me something about that. Well, Henry Duncan actually saw the, the, the tremendous artistry and, and, and historic significance of the cross uh, which had been thrown down because of an edict of the General Assembly, and he re-erected it, he rebuilt it in the cross, right here. In right the, here? The, yes. And then it was taken inside the church? That's right. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Oh, I see you've got some repair works going on in the old building. 
Yes, uh, we're having it pointed up because we have a very important centenary coming up. It's a hundred years since the cross was taken back inside the church. And this is the gravestone of the Reverend Gavin Young, who was minister here for 54 years. And he was the man who really saved the cross. Yes, he was the one. He dug a, a trench in the earthen floor of the church and lowered it gently into it. And it was his efforts, really, that saved the cross. And it lay there for 150 years. Yes, that's Under true. the floor. Yes. What a marvellous story. Ah, thank you. It's an unusual shape. Well, of course, because it's so old, the shape has altered over the years. This aisle here, for instance, was added. And of course, when they brought the cross back into the church a hundred years ago, they took the whole of the side out, brought the cross in, dug a hole and put it there and rebuilt the side and put in the apse. It's a, a preaching cross. It tells a sermon on stone. It's a gigantic visual aid. People would gather around this cross and worship as best they could in the absence of a priest or a monk. The great mystery about the cross is who carved it and, and who set it up in a land of rude, unlettered people. How long ago were you thinking of? 680. 1,300 years ago? 1,300 years. One interesting thing about the cross you'll have noticed that it's fairly badly worn on one side. When it was lowered into the trench in the earth floor of the church, people, being what they are, and because, of course, there were no pews in the church in these days, because it was there, they sat on it. So it was worn by people's breeches <laughs> for 150 years. Uh, the clothes must have been getting rough in these days, too. <laughs> That's true. Well, it really is a truly marvellous story. And I must thank you very much for giving up a morning. I know you were going on a hospital visit, but it's been a great pleasure for me. So thank you very much indeed. That's I really my, enjoyed it. It's my pleasure, Tom. Thank, thank you. you. Because the Solway is fringed with low-lying land, high tides flood over it and cleanse a special spring of water noted for its health-giving properties. There's a very sad connection between Robert Burns, our greatest national poet, and Ruthwell. In the last days of his life, he used to come here to drink the iron waters of this spring, which was said to be very, very good for people in his rheumatic condition. He also bathed in the sea. And he came here often, and he stayed in a wee house just up there. And one day, when he was going back to Dumfries, passing through Ruthwell, the minister's wife invited him in because she thought he looked very poorly. And when he came into the house, the daughter of the house went to pull the curtains, and the wife said to Burns, how are you feeling? He said, I feel like a poor plucked chicken. And as the girl went to pull the curtain, he said, don't pull the curtains, dear lady. The sun hasn't much time left to shine on me. And these were prophetic words because he was dead before many days had passed.
In Dumfries, Burns, the poet of the people, is remembered in marble above its busiest roundabout. But few people notice the other white statue which looks across to him from the Trustees Savings Bank building. It commemorates the father of Savings Banks, the Reverend Henry Duncan. Burns had no chance to be a saver. His very last mutterings were about a small debt he owed.